Dr. Mathur is an endocrinologist by uh, trade, uh, but she works on microbiome and a very cool part of microbiome, how microbiome uh, involves the sex hormones and how it involves aging and how it involves uh, diseases that affect uh, our body based on hormones. And this can be, for example, polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome. So she's a pioneer in that field and uh, very excited to hear about uh, the role of uh, gut microbiome as general, especially in the setting of endocrinology. Hi, everybody. So full disclosure, as Dr. Rezai just said, I am not a gastroenterologist. I'm an endocrinologist. But aside from that, or because of that, I get the most interesting talk, I think. Um, and I hope you all agree. So let me just make sure this works. There we go. So let's start off with a basic question. What is the microbiome? Well, the microbiome is any and all microbes that are in and on our, our bodies. So there are microbes that are in our mouth, as Dr. Rosai was talking about, on our skin, in our vaginal flora. So all of these different areas in our body actually have their own microbiome. Now, we used to call it normal flora. That was kind of the medical term. We now call it microbiome. Um, but if you look here on this slide, you'll see the um, phylogenetic tree of life. Some of you may have flashbacks to biology and in uh, high school with this, but um, you'll notice here that the phylogenetic tree has three arms. We usually think of two. We think of the bacteria and we think of the eukaryotic cells, right? These ones are plants and animals, fung uh, fungi, and these ones, of course, are bacteria. But there's a third branch here, which is archaea. And archaea were initially grouped together with bacteria, but they're now thought to be very different. And the reason I point it out is because they actually have a specific role in humans. Um, they are the organisms that produce methane. So you're going to hear a lot about that in the talks that are subsequent to this. Now, what you don't see on this tree is viruses, even though viruses are part of our microbiome. And the reason is that a virus really isn't considered part of the tree of life unless it's actually hijacked another organism. So um, once it does that, its metabolism and it starts to get revved up and it actually has an action. So it's not actually considered part of the original tree of life. So as I mentioned, bacteria, archaea, bacteriophages, fungi, protozoa, and viruses, all of these live in and on us. And if you look at the data, it suggests that there are actually more microbes that make us uh, than human cells, which is kind of an interesting concept. If you put us in a blender, about 56 of us would be microbial cells versus uh, less than that for humans. So the interesting thing, too, is that when you look at the microbes, obviously the largest proponent is going to be housed in the gut. Um, so even though we do have flora everywhere else, the gut is really responsible for that interaction between us and our microbial world. So I put this slide on here because I think it's kind of fascinating because we always talk about the human microbiome, but the microbiome actually exists everywhere. And so this is actually a flea, this is an electron microscopy of a flea that was on a dog. And then on this flea, you see a mite, you see two mites. And inside the mite, you see bacteria. So this is the mite's microbiome, which is on the flea, which is on the dog, which is in our house. So there's microbiomes that exist all around us and affect all living creatures. And I think that's really important for us to remember. OK, so now we're moving to bigger animals. This is a cow. Um, we're going to call her Bessie for the purpose of this talk. So Bessie eats grass. Bessie loves grass. Bessie survives on grass. Bessie cannot digest grass. So she doesn't have the enzyme that you need in her own body and in her own mechanism to do that. And that enzyme is cellulase. She can't break down cellulose, which is basically the structure of grass. So what does she do? She chews, and she swallows, and she exposes the grass and gives you more surface area. And inside her gut, the bacteria help her break down the grass. And then that goes, cows, by the way, only have one stomach. It just has four parts to it. So it goes into the ruminal part of their stomach. She brings it back up, she chews her cud, exposes the grass to more surface area, it goes back down, and she keeps doing this until the bacteria can actually break down the grass so she can digest the nutrition in it. So it's kind of an interesting story where Bessie is dependent on her microbiome for survival, right? So she has over 50 billion bacteria per one cc of rumen, which is kind of amazing. And a lot of these organisms produce methane, hence cows, methane, greenhouse gas, et cetera. So if I take Bessie and I decide I'm going to give her antibiotics and I'm going to get rid of her microbiome, bad things happen to Bessie. Um, Bessie will die because she cannot absorb anything. She will starve. Okay? Um, no 
cows were hurt in the making of this talk. Um, however, if I alter Bessie's microbiome and say I get rid of some of the microbes, but not all of them, so I selectively give her antibiotics, I can make Bessie really big. This is not Bessie, but I can make Bessie really big. So this has actually been used in animal husbandry forever. Um, they've done this for decades and decades, where if you go to the supermarket and you see meat and you see no antibiotics, no hormones, this is part of the antibiotic story. They, farmers and, and husbandry, uh, animal husbandry folks, have known for years that if you give low-dose antibiotics to young animals, um, fowl as well as um, cows and, and pigs, you can actually make them bigger you can actually make them gain weight, and the farmer gets more bang for his buck. So this manipulation of the microbiome has been around for a very long time in all different situations. So let's focus on humans, and let's go back. Let's talk about sort of the history of humans and the microbiome. Way back in the 6th century BC, there was a group, a religious group that was very popular in Southeast Asia, particularly in India, called Jainism. And in the Jaini community, they had a concept of a nagoda, and what a nagoda is, is it was a organism that was thought to be sort of omnipresent. It was uh, in animals, in our bodies, on plants, and on animals. They were small, and they didn't have a very long half-life. They, they kind of fluttered in and out of our lives. And according to Mahavir, who was the head of the, the Jannies at the time, these nagodas were actually destroyed by humans. When we breathed in and out, we would destroy them. When we sat, we would sit on them. So Jannies were very passive, and they wanted to make sure they didn't hurt these nagodas. And so as they evolved as a religion, they actually wore masks long before COVID, long before masks were fashionable to prevent the destruction of these little nagodas. And they actually carried little um, uh, brooms where they could sort of sweep the dust when they were sitting so that these nagodas wouldn't get hurt. So way back then, 6th century BC, there was this concept that there were things that we couldn't see that were alive and that lived around us. Let's fast forward a little bit and we go to the first millennium. This is actually a story of a Persian um, philosopher and, and a physician. His name was Ibn Sina, very popular uh, in Persian literature. Um, and he was considered one of the forefathers of medicine. Um, and his, his works are, are monumental and instrumental in progressing science forward. And he wrote many, many textbooks, uh, and one of which was the canon of medicine. And in this canonic version, he talks about the possibility that diseases like tuberculosis are actually contagious, meaning they can jump from one person to another. Of course, back then, they didn't know exactly how that was happening, but this concept of communicability and perhaps there being a vector between people started to become more and more popular. And this work actually was seminal in medical literature far through the Middle Ages up until about the 1700s. So this was kind of a, a per permeable thought uh, that was in the medical community at the time. We then move on to uh, uh, Van Leeuwenhoek. So I'm sure that this name is familiar to some of you. Or, or you do you know what he did, anybody in the audience? He was actually uh, attributed to the one who invented the microscope. So there was a guy named Robert Hooke who did this before, but he kind of took it to the next level. And what you see down here in the corner is actually his microscope. So what he did was he actually put together two small brass plates. They were about the size of a credit card. And in between those brass plates, he drilled a hole. And in between that hole, he put in a biconvex, biconvex uh, piece of glass. So it was like a little bubble. And based on that, he had a little um, uh, stick that went on the back of it that he could adjust the length, the focal length of whatever was on that little stick. And he could actually see things. And he did this initially because he was um, in the um, clothing industry. And he wanted to look at the fibers of silk and stuff. But then he got curious. And he started to put liquids on there. And he started to put a little bit of blood, a little bit of spit, maybe some urine. And he saw things that were swimming around in there. And so he was actually the first person to see a microbe. Um, and he called it at the time an animacule. Um, so an animal that was small enough to kind of be like a molecule, minuscule. Um, so the term uh, animacule was what was used in the literature. Um, but he was the first one, and he's credited with sort of the start of microbiology. And of course, then we go to Darwin. And Darwin lived in the 1850s where everyone was romantic and everyone had poetry. And so he came up with this beautiful little phrase where he talks about each living creature 
must be looked at as a microcosm, a little universe formed by a host of self-propagating organisms, inconceivably minute and as numerous as the stars in heaven. So began the modern thought about the microbiome. This is a mural that we have at Cedars. It's in one of our major auditoriums, um, and it basically goes through Judaic contributions to medical history. And in the middle of this mural, you see this gentleman right here. And this brings us more to the modern age. So we're now in about the early 1900s. This gentleman's name is um, Eli Mechnikov, and he was born in what is now Ukraine. And he has this uh, wonderful history of being interested in longevity. He wanted to see why people aged and what was contributing to aging. And he was actually one of the first proponents of this sort of concept of the gut being instrumental in human health. And he proposed that something happened in the gut that would cause toxins to leak out into the system and that would make the human ill. Whether that illness was someplace else didn't really matter, it still stemmed from the gut. And he was a big proponent of yogurt. He was one of the first people to say we need to eat better foods and his thing was yogurt at the time. And so he was kind of the father of prebiotics, probiotics, FMT, um, it all started here. And now here we sit, uh, like 100 years later, still looking at that relationship and still trying to sort of figure out what's going on here. So in the 19th century, we became really interested in eradicating things that were bad for us in the environment, right? Um, things like external infection and external disease was really the biggest cause of death, right? Communicable dis diseases, that and of course um, um, childbirth. So we actually started as, as a society trying to get rid of things that would cause death. We cleaned our water supply. We didn't know before that we had to do that. We started filtering and cleaning the water systems. We started antibiotics right in the 1900s. We know that antibiotics were used, and they were used a lot, um, and perhaps um, without discrimination for a time period. And all of this stuff changed not only the external environment and made it more friendly for humans to actually live, increased our lifespan, increased our longevity, but it also started to change our microbial composition. Being exposed to things like uh, antibacterial products, hello, remember three years ago? Crazy, right? All of that stuff changed our microbial composition. And there's actually now a school of thought that exposure to these things results in eradication of really important microorganisms. And we may never get those back. Um, Martin Blazer is sort of a proponent of this, and he wrote a book called The Vanishing Microbiome, which is really a fascinating concept that as we become cleaner and cleaner and we do these sterilization practices, our microbiome has changed, and we've lost some very important fundamental micro microbes um, throughout the course of human life. And there's a question as to whether or not that's now related to what we think of as modern diseases. Asthma, um, atopic dermatitis, obesity, type 2 diabetes, is this somehow related to this modernization that's going on and changes in our hygiene techniques. So when we look at how things are developing in the world of the microbiome, we're now starting to understand the symbiosis that occurs. And our focus has shifted from external pathogens and trying to get rid of those to looking at how our internal microbiome actually affects us. So we're questioning the role of our hygiene, we're rethinking antibiotic use, we're trying to understand what influences our microbiome, what do drugs do, what does diet do, and we're trying to understand how that internal microbiome sort of affects us as the host. So that's where we currently are in our dialogue with the microbiome. So as I'm talking, some of you must be thinking, well, then just tell us what a healthy microbiome is. Um, and I can do that in one sentence. We don't know. So we don't know what a healthy microbiome is. And what's healthy for me may be very different from what's healthy for you and what's healthy for you and what's healthy for a child or somebody who's growing up in another country. We really don't know. Um, and our thought process is, is changing now from, from thinking just about one microbe and one disease to how communities of microbes actually affect us. We're also starting to think about concepts rather than specific organisms, so things like redundancy and diversity. So if I have a group of organisms that can do one function for me and I wipe them out, I'm kind of like out of luck, right? But if I have three or four different communities that can perform the same function and one of them gets wiped out, I can still survive, I can still do that process, whatever that process may be. And the same thing with diversity. 
we know that diversity is a good thing when we look at the communities around us and we, when we look at how we live as humans, right? It's the same thing in the microbial world. When you look at diversity, it tends to be associated with health. So diseases like IBD, diseases like obesity, diseases like diabetes, those are all associated with a decrease in diversity, um, which is kind of a very interesting concept. So I just told you that we don't know what a healthy microbiome is and how this is going to be a very individual thing based on who you are, what you need, and what diseases you have. Um, but you'll see that there's an incredible amount of interest in the microbiome, so much so that, of course, companies are springing up, people are selling things, products are available. You can put probiotics in your lipstick, you can put them on your face cream, you can eat them, you can ingest them, you can wear them. I mean, it's kind of crazy. So what you see here is the human therapeutic market right now for microbiomes, and it's exponentially going up. And then what you see in the slide beside it is the disease states that are being treated. So this is the therapeutic market size and the estimation of growth over the next decade. There is a lot of things on the market and on the horizon for you guys to buy. Be careful. Buyer beware. Uh, just make sure that you understand what you're getting into when you look at these products. So let's talk a little bit about science. Um, the microbiome inside the human does a lot of things for us, and in turn, we do a lot of things for our microbiome. So on this slide, you see some of the things that they do for us. They help us in our immune defense. As Dr. Rezai pointed out, they also have uh, other things where they help us digest the undigestible. Uh, they produce peptide mediators for us. They help regulate our body weight and our body temperatures. Uh, and of course, they produce gas and other byproducts that will be discussed later on um, by those who know much more about that than I do. Um, and they modulate our immune response and help us make vitamins. So they do a lot of things to make us healthy and keep us happy. And in turn, we keep them warm, we keep them safe, and we keep them well fed. So that's kind of the symbiosis between us and our microbes. How do we get our microbiome? Where does it come from? Well, there's some thoughts that the initial exposure may be with the placenta. What we choose to feed our infants when they're born, do we breastfeed them or do we bottle feed them? That will make a difference. What we choose to feed them when they wean and during childhood. What our own genetics are like. What do we like to harbor? What's our gastric pH? What's you know the environment that we choose to have genetically? The amount of exposure for antibiotics and drugs when our uh, children are little. Timmy with the ear infection, that sort of story. Um, and where we live geographically. All of these things will play a role in how our microbiome ultimately develops. This is a great study. Um, it's a little bit older now, but nevertheless, I think it gives us a fantastic visual. This is a child up until about 830 days of age. This is birth. This is as the child is growing. Oops, sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. There. Um, and over here are the microbial species. So what you see here is when the child is on breast milk, the microbial pattern throughout the timeline that he's on breast milk is pretty similar. When the child is weaned onto rice cereal, it changes, weaning the child to table food and ultimately to an adult diet. If you look at the adult diet microbiome and the breast milk microbiome, it's pretty evident that they're very different. So what we feed our children makes a very big difference as to what they colonize with. Now, colonization of the microbiome usually occurs within about the first three years of life. And this is a great study that looks at three populations in different parts of the world. In Malawi, in um, uh, Venezuela, this is an Amerindian population, and in the United States. And the color codes are right here. So when you look here at the observed taxonomical units, these are basically um, markers of colonization of the gut. You can see that as we move forward, most of the gut gets colonized right here within about three years or four years of life, right? And everything looks pretty similar. All looks good across all three of these um, geographical groups of people. But look what happens as we age. This is an adult population. Again, the US is in blue, the Malawians and the Amerindians are in um, red and green, respectively. And look at what you see. You see a marked division in the types of microbes that we harbor versus those in agricultural, more natural um, environments. So is this diet? Is it environment? Is it genetics, antibiotics, meds? We don't really know. But something happens here that causes our microbiome to start to diverge. And whether this is a good thing or not is what we are exploring. 
So what's the evidence for the gut microbiome actually affecting human disease? Well, I'm an endocrinologist, so one of the diseases I study is obesity. And we know that obesity is not a one-size-fits-all, right? We know that there's a whole bunch of things involved with becoming obese. Environment, genetics, meds, um, psychosocial issues, et cetera. But let's just make the assumption that we're going to take a look at this one part. We're going to look at the GI microbes. And let's go back to a, a model here. This is a mouse. I like to name them. So this one is going to be Mickey. Um, Mickey here is germ-free, and what that means is that he is born from a cesarean section, and he's kept completely isolated, and his food is irradiated, and he's not exposed to any germs at all. So he's not a happy guy. He's kind of um, sickly. He has to eat a lot to maintain his weight. Cardiovascularly, he's not as good as he should be, um, and his immune system's kind of not so great. So he's not a terribly happy mouse, completely germ-free. So let's give him some microbes. So let's give him and expose him to the fecal flora of a healthy mouse. What happens to Mickey? He gains some body weight, his heart rate slows down, his, immuni his um, immunogenicity improves, he gets a little bit more healthy, he looks really good. So let's take it one step further and let's give Mickey the fecal material uh, through a gavage and colonize him with microbes from an obese mouse. Mickey gets really big. No mice were harmed in the making of this lecture. Um, Mickey gets really big. Um, and this is an interesting concept here where we know that obesity can actually be a transmittable disease. So what does this show you? This shows you that the microbiome can affect the host phenotype. And it also shows you that it might be able to transmit a phenotype, which is so fascinating. And all of this sort of animal work and stuff has led to multiple, multiple, like large grant-funded um, consortiums all across the world to try to look at the microbiome. So we've got huge consortiums in Europe, in Canada, in the United States, all trying to decipher exactly what's going on here. And when we look at the literature, we see that the amount of science that's going out based on microbiome work has exploded. So in the last five years, there's been over 100,000 papers published on the microbiome. And in the last year, about 26,000. So it's increasing. And there's a lot of data out there. But the question then becomes, what do we do with that data, right? Is that really cause and effect? Are we really showing something? What's relevant? What do we do? How do we decipher this as a scientific community? And how do we pass that information on to you guys so that you make the right choices for your own health? Well, it turns out that it's complicated. And Dr. Rezai just went through a lot of information about the gut. But let's talk about the microbes that live in the gut. So we used to think that these microbes were just scattered around, right? That we had anaerobic microbes, we had gram-negatives, gram-positive -co cockets. They were all just kind of all mixed up in the gut. And you know, we didn't really know how they lived or what they did exactly. But then we realize that it's not like that at all that these microbes actually form communities. And these communities are actually very intricate. So certain microbes like to be in a certain environment. They like to have certain neighbors. Certain microbes have different functions. So you can equate it to a city. And you can think of yourself, well, a city has sanitation workers, teachers, lawyers, doctors, has a diversity of jobs to make that city function. If I did something here, and I, I took all of the teachers in this city, and I gave them a cold, and they couldn't come into work. I'd be lost if I didn't have substitute teachers, right? So redundancy is also important. So when we look at these microbial communities, that's how they live. They live in these communities that have redundancy and diversity to make sure that these communities can tr thrive, right? So the infrastructure can be relatable to a city. Now let's take that city, and let's put it in different parts of the world. Let's say we've got a city, um, let's say we've got LA, we've got Paris, we've got um, Delhi, and we've got Tokyo, right? They will all have the same infrastructure. They'll have commonality with how those cities are kind of put together, but they have different geography, different food sources, different languages, different pastimes, right? They have their own character. Each city has its own vibe. So you can think of that as the microbial communities too when you think about where they're distribu distributed in the gut. So. You can look at this, and as Dr. Rezai said, the gut is huge, right? We've got like 30 feet of gut within us. And when we break that down, each of those little segments, depending on where you are in the gut, is going to have a different exposure. It's going to have a different partial pressure. It's going to have a different pH. 
you know, these microbes can live in the different layers of the gut that Dr. Rizai talked about? Are they mucosal? Are they in the stool? Where are they? And how does that play a role in how they communicate and what they do for us? So it's an extraordinarily complicated topic when we talk about the microbiome. It's not a sort of a monolithic entity. And the GI tract is complicated, right? So Dr. Rizai went through this already. I won't belabor the point. Aside from to say, the small bowel is really important. So what we see is all of the stuff that's really cool happens in the small bowel. That's where we absorb our nutrition. That's where we have our incretins. That's where the bile comes in. It's kind of the most active part of the bowel. And the stool is really formed in the last three to five feet, right? So um, when we think about the small bowel, and if we iron it and we flatten it out, it's the size of a tennis court. There's a lot of stuff that can go on there. But when we think about how the, the, the literature reviews the microbiome, they basically do it mostly with stool, and they use stool as a surrogate. So the question is, can stool actually represent the entire um, microbiome milieu of this 30 feet of intestine? And that's something that we at Cedars are looking at right now. So we consider stool as kind of like going through someone's garbage, right? You can see the leftover takeout containers, the Grubhub. You can find all that stuff, an empty um, prescription of Tylenol. You'll find all that stuff in, in the garbage. But it's not the same as going into somebody's house and opening the fridge or opening the medicine cabinet and seeing kind of how they truly live. So we equate the stool to looking in the back in the dumpster, and we equate the small bowel to actually opening the fridge and looking in the cupboards. And when we take a look at the publications that I just talked about, I told you how prolific the field is right now, less than 500 of the 26,000 papers that were published in the last year looked at the small bowel. So we feel it's sort of an undervalued, under, um, under-informed area uh, that we need to look at. So over at Cedar sinai in the MAST program, we have um, a project that we do. It's called the Reimagine program. And essentially what we do is we take subjects that are coming into Cedars for an upper endoscopy, and we analyze the aspirates. So we have a wonderful team of GI docs that do this for us, some of whom will be speaking today. Um, and they collect small intestinal biopsies and aspirates for us. And by looking at this and comparing it to some of the blood uh, that we collect, the questionnaires, uh, the medical uh, records that we can look at, as well as for stool, um, we can fingerprint these subjects, um, fingerprint quote unquote microbially, and start to compare it with diseases. So suppose we have um, patients that have a rheumatologic disease. We can start to say what is different in the microbiome of the small intestine in people that have that disease. What's less, what's more, what's aberrant, and what can we do to try to infiltrate that and try to kind of fix that process? We can try to personalize this approach, hence the term personalized medicine. And to date, we have almost uh, 800 subjects that we're, we have cataloged and that we're looking at right now. So as you're now well aware, the small intestine consists of three segments, the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, and then of course the large intestine follows. And so what we found when we looked at the uh, microbiome of the small intestine, we've looked at these particular segments, duodenum, jejunum, furthest distance, which we are assuming is ileum because these are done by endoscopy, and large intestine, which is stool. And this is sort of a topographical map of the microbiome that we see. Each of these colors represents a cluster of microbes, a specific type. In this case, it's at the genus level. And you don't have to know what they are, but let's just look at the colors, right? So here in the stool, we see a lot of green. We hardly see any green in the duodenum. Here, we see a lot of purple, hardly any purple here. So just by looking at this sort of topographical map as we descend down the intestine, we can see that the profile of the microbes that are here are very, very different proximally to distally. So this is why we think looking at the small bowel is so important. So I've taken you through a journey where we started off like, what, 600 BC, and we've kind of um, arrived to now, like today, which is kind of fascinating. And what we want to do is we want to start to look specifically at diseases um, that are related to what we think is a small intestinal microbiome. And these are some of the areas that we're exploring at MAST. We are looking at the relationship between hormone therapy and how that alters a microbiome, age and the aging process. We're looking at androgen production and testosterone production, differences between the sexes, because believe it or not, males and females eating exactly the same food have a different microbiome. 
uh, obesity, diabetes, we're looking at cortisol growth hormone. You'll hear about SIBO and EMO here uh, a little bit later on, rheumatologic diseases, and we're also looking at fatty liver. So we have a lot going on, and we're hoping that, you know, as we add on to this chain of interest over, you know, the millennia, um, that we'll be able to contribute to some answers as to how the microbiome affects these particular diseases. So with that, um, you all can take a screenshot of that if you like. Um, this brings you to um, our MAST website, and you're more than welcome to come on. We have links to some of the papers. Um, we've got some uh, interviews and some YouTube stuff on there, too. Um, you can see our handles up here. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us, follow us, um, and we'll do this journey together. Thank you so much for your time.